was 1978 or 1979, there were some newspaper articles. There were a couple women who had applied to the Madison Fire Department, been hired, and then they had been fired. And um, I knew one of the women. I had run track with Marsha Holtz when I was in college. And I was actually in graduate school myself at the time. And I was part of the men's physical education department because they didn't teach exercise physiology in the women's physical education department. Uh, and I thought, I knew Marsha, farm girl. She ran the 440 hurdles. To me, that's like one of the toughest races there is. And I thought, wow, if Marsha Holt can do it, I don't know who can, you know. I started out in 1978. We were fired after three weeks, and then they gave us a letter saying that we were being terminated because we lacked upper body strength. We kind of patted you on the back and said, it's okay, you, you uh, go and get stronger, and then the next time that there's a recruit class that's going to come on, you can try out for that class. There was a lot of pressure during that first three weeks, and Marsha and I would be pulled out of class to do these interviews with the press. I didn't realize how political the department was going to be, and the union didn't want the women, and the administration were trying to push the women into the job. And when we were taken out of the class to do these interviews, we'd go back in, and the instructors wouldn't give us the information that we missed. They'd say, well, you need to get it from one of your classmates and our classmates weren't necessarily forthcoming on what we had missed. In the first three weeks, we would be expected to advance a two and a half inch clothesline 100 feet with two people. Well, we did that. Then all of a sudden it was, no, it's 125 feet. So we did that, then it was 150 feet. Well, me and my partner got 147 feet. He, he passed and I failed. So it was kind of, you kind of go, how can that be if this is a partnership? You know, shouldn't we both be fail failing? Well, no, he just did better than you. Well, how does that work? <laughs> you know, they just wouldn't answer the questions. It was such blatant discrimination towards the women. And I'm just saying to myself, if they told me now that I can't do the job, do you think they're gonna rehire me later on if I, if I try to apply again? And I'm going, no. So Marsh and I talked about it and then we finally decided that it would be best to, to get an attorney and see what an attorney had to say. Chief Durkin came to our attorney and said to us that if we hire you back into the job, um, would you drop the lawsuit? We basically said that um, yes, we wanted our jobs back. It was just hard to determine who you should believe and who you shouldn't believe and because you got stories from everybody from all different sides and it was just very, very overwhelming at the time. And really, we wanted just our jobs. We, you know, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to be firefighters. When we finally did come back, um, we were brought into the 1980 class. We were told that if you make it through this class, you will be just like anybody else and you have to go through the three and a half year apprenticeship. So I did my own little lit search on the strength and the qualities needed to, you know, be able to do firefighting. And I, because of what I was learning in school on that, I thought, oh, well, if I improve my grip strength a little bit, I probably could do that. I have the cardiovascular and kind of the overall physical strength from my interest in sports and that. Then I met another woman. I met Pam Jacobson at the weight room and I was learning how to lift weights from her. You gotta remember when this was, that we didn't weight lift in the 70s, that type of thing. And just my involvement in athletics, I, I did that when I was in college in the early 70s. So this was just all a lot of new opportunities. Pam invited me, she'd gotten an invitation. Chief Durkin wanted to give her a tour of Station One and she asked if she could bring me along and <laughs> Chief Durkin took one look at me, you know, I'm fairly tall and I was pretty athletic at the time. And he sat me down and he said, well, what are you doing? You know, I said, well, I'm in graduate school. I want to become a women's volleyball and basketball coach and, you know, probably work at one of the smaller colleges here. And he's like, well, how much money will you make when you do that? You know, and he laid out all the benefits and told me about the schedule and all this kind of stuff. And I would say that's what probably really perked my interest. If I would have had my druthers at that point in my life, I would have been a professional athlete. And, um, and I had been playing amateur volleyball and basketball quite a bit after college. 
And I thought, you know, that fire department schedule, that'd be real nice for some of the tournaments we're going to, that type of thing. Because I had a background in physical education in college and was really active, I, I didn't know if I'd be able to, but I thought it was worth trying. I mean, I didn't come into the work assuming that I could do it. I was sort of very interested and wondering if it was something I could do. The main reason that I tried to become a firefighter was to get into the paramedic program. When I called and asked the administration, they said, well, the only way you can do that is to become a firefighter, so you have to apply to be a firefighter first. I tried to apply in St. Paul, Minnesota, so I wasn't really aware of what was going on in Madison. They wouldn't give me an application because I was a woman, so I had come back to the Madison area and Janesville, Wisconsin was in the hiring process, so I started doing some training to be ready for their physical exam, took their written and physical exam, and was told I was hired, was just about ready to start when their chief called me to tell me that I was unhired. <laughs> and that he was not going to be the chief to hire the first woman on their fire department. So at that point, my father said, well, Madison is taking applications. I didn't know anything about Chief Durkin recruiting and looking for women, so I became aware of it when I actually came to take the test. We'd heard a lot about the physical tests. They wanted us to do push-ups and sit-ups, carry a 125-pound like sandbag, put on an air pack and climb up a ladder, all this kind of stuff. So, so that was kind of the, the main thing that I focused on. I also knew there was a written test and I had no idea it was a civil service exam of some sort. I remember taking the exam and thinking, oh, they're trying to figure out if I have like mechanical abilities. You know, there's just all these little diagrams that are like little cogs and, you know, there'd be like nine cogs on a page. Cog five turns counterclockwise. What direction is cog? You know, that kind of thing. So I was like, wow, that, I thought it was a fun test. <laughs> so, um, and then there was, um, Durkin had hired a woman. Uh, she was a local um, FIED teacher, Beth Emshoff. She designed like a training class at the Y downtown, the Women's Y downtown, to help women train for the particular test. But of course, Pam and I, you know, the weightlifters and me, the exercise physiologist, I'm analyzing all the tests and things like that and figuring out, you know, okay, how can I train to be able to do this? Um, but the nice thing about the thing at the Y was they actually had that 125 pound sandbag. So you got to pick it up and see what it would feel like to carry, and how you were gonna carry it, you know. The woman that had run a, a training program for women preparing for the test basically suggested that I wasn't probably gonna be capable of passing the test because I hadn't gone through that preparation program, but I did, and you know, went through that whole process. The physical agility test in Madison was held at a field house and uh, indoors for part of it, and then we did a run outdoors after. So it was a series of pulling, lifting, walking balance beams, sit-ups. Climb up a, a certain height of a wall, so like if you were stuck in a basement, you'd be able to get yourself out. Um, jumping up to grab a hold of ladders that were positioned horizontally. 50 push-ups in a, in a minute or something like that. Pulling yourself up on top and crawling to the other end and dropping down. It was just such a such a strange time when, you know, you've never really been surrounded by press and everything before to all of a sudden be, you know, barraged by him with a lot of questions about what you were doing and how did it go and do you think you're going to make it? And, you know, it's like, well, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> the academy was kind of tough. A lot of it was just new. The equipment was new. I remember I had the hardest time getting my boots to stay on when I climbed up the ladder. I had these long, narrow feet. So I basically had to stuff my feet into a boot that was about two sizes too short for me so they wouldn't fall off when I was climbing up the, the ladder. And then I had a coat that felt like it practically came to the ground. I don't know, the shoulders were falling off me, that kind of thing. And, you know, and there were, there were just mechanical things we had to kind of figure out. Like one of the things was, you know, the gloves. Now I have fairly big hands, but you know, they're not like chunky, <laughs> you know, but the gloves were just, just like seemed so big, you know? And so it was hard, you know, with some of the things like raising the fly section of the ladder was, was hard with those gloves. It just seems like the gloves were getting slick and it was just hard to get a grip. And so, um, so Marsha and Pam and Jan and you know some of the other women 
and I, we started just noticing some of the things that were being kind of difficult for us and kind of coaching each other and, and talking a lot. So one of the things we figured out with raising the ladder was is if you grabbed the rope like this and turned your wrist, it, there was more friction, you had a better bite on the rope and then there was no problem raising the ladder if you did this, just because everybody else, this is how they were teaching you how to do it. You know, it still, it worked really well to do it this way. And There was a great deal in terms of, of fire science and then the actual physical skills of firefighting. We were also getting training as EMTs, so the emergency medical part of it. So a lot of it was very interesting, and then some of it was very challenging. But the part that was the most challenging was working with training officers who felt that the women wouldn't be capable of doing this and also who didn't feel we really should be there. And some of them, I think, felt pressure from firefighters in the field who made the assumption that women probably weren't physically capable of doing that kind of work. Every day you would receive a evaluation. There'd be a list of things that we had done that day, um, whether it was rappelling down a building, carrying a ladder down, um, hanging a smoke ejector, or whatever you were happened to be doing, you would be evaluated on it. I mean, it just almost got laughable after a while because it, that, there were no specific comments about how you did something, even though you completed it in your mind, you completed it just fine. But it always said, at, at the end of our paper, on the end of the day, it was always lacks upper body strength. You know, they just kept saying that on anything physical that we got graded on, you know, and there was no way to kind of get more information about what is it exactly that I'm not, not doing right. I think I probably only got maybe four or five things where they said I did things correctly but I didn't do things any differently than any of the men did. But yet they turned around and said that we lacked upper body strength. And to me, that was another way of trying to put the pressure on the women and trying to get us out of the job because it's like, what are you saying? That just my upper part of my body is the only part that goes to a fire? And I was bench pressing 225 pounds at the time. I just had to kind of reach in and find my, that really strong, part of me in order to get through some of those days at the academy because um, it was tough. Um, we knew that um, some of the folks in administration were, were rooting for us, you know, and people in the community were rooting for us, but we also knew a lot of people didn't really want us there and didn't want us to be successful. But there were times where I would be asked to do something four times in a row when the men in my training class would do it once. And I think the idea was that I wouldn't be able to complete it because they'd, I would be so fatigued that I could be given a fail for my evaluation on that day. You know, and check mark, unsatisfactory. But every day you'd get this and every day you were basically told that you weren't good enough on a regular basis. And, and after a while, after you get told that so many times, you start to think, well, maybe I'm not. Because of the, the makeup of the class I was hired in, you know, there was about a third of white women. There were, was about a third of men of color. The other third was white men. Most had relatives on the job. Durkin was trying to be very political and appease some of the factions in the fire department. As so I started developing friendships, particularly with some of the African-American men, you know, giving me tips and that type of thing. But also they just started, you know, I'll, be, I'll go with you. I'll be your partner, that type of thing. Whereas a lot of time the women, no one asked the women to be their partner, <laughs> you know. And uh, same thing with um, search and rescue drill. Um, Hubert McKenzie was just like, I'll be your partner, you know, and um, Ronnie Greer, you know, I'll be your partner, that kind of thing. And we, we, I think Ronnie Greer and I did the search and rescue drill and carried out one of our 195 pound classmates, you know, like with the fastest time. And I remember one of the older officers just going, <laughs> and that, that, but we knew we'd done good, <laughs> you know. So that was just one of the most positive things to me, building these relationships in, in the academy. Because we were, we were brought back into the class, um, it caused animosity between some of the men and some of the women. While they couldn't do it before, they're not gonna be able to do it now without even knowing the circumstances. I remember a time where we were having to do fireman carries and Marsha and I, we each had to pick up one of the biggest guys in the class and we both did it without a problem. And all of a sudden it was kind of a, a change in the men. It was kind of like, oh, 
I guess maybe they can. Maybe there was something we were missing there. The first fire station I was in, the rookie before I got there, Chris Hinkes, called himself a lieutenant in charge of the rookies. It was myself and one of the other men in my class. And he made sure that we you know, knew what all the chores that were expected of us as a rookie and was willing to share what he knew from his experience. One of my two officers at Station One who really felt like as an officer, if any new recruit who had actually made it through the academy failed, it was his failure, not their failure. All the women were either at Station One or else they were out at Station 2, because Station 2 at the time was one of the only places that had um, separate quarters for, for the women. So at Station 2, they had done a little bit of remodeling. There was a bedroom with two beds in it, and there was a bathroom in that bedroom. And I think that, that eased our transition. The station one, the, the third floor level was so large that they had put a wall down the middle of a really long bathroom and fairly good sized room that could accommodate several beds and lockers in that room and then connected to a bathroom that was on the other side of the wall from the men's. And I think it was helpful too in that people could just be focused on their work and not whether or not somebody's going to walk in on them in the shower or, you know, whatever. The other stations with smaller sleeping areas, you know, everybody's sleeping in a bed right next to each other like a, a dormitory situation. But the common areas on the second floor, you know, we were always together. It's really only when you're sleeping that you were kind of separated from the rest of your crew. So compared to some of the other stations, it was pretty ideal in terms of everybody's comfort, I think. It kind of segregated us from the rest of the department. I think it would have been better if he would have just taken and let the women go to all the different stations and just let, let the chips fall, you know? And it was kind of like he was trying to protect us, you know, and that's how the men felt about it, was that we were um, being kept away from certain, certain crews or certain groups of people or, or whatever. And After the first year at number two, then I went over to the old number eight over on North Street. There I was told, well, there is an extra bedroom and you could take it or we could let Joe Wiedekind sleep there <laughs> because he snores really loud <laughs> and you could just sleep in the main bedroom. And so that made sense to me to just sleep in the main bedroom. All the women, they were all very individuals and they were all very personable people. And I think that just knowing those women that we would have all done better off being out in the stations, um, in, in separate stations, because we really didn't need the support groups. You know, we really didn't need that. We would have, and I think the men would have accepted the women better um, by being able to work with them rather than just hear the rumors that came out of Station One or the rumors that came out of Station Two as to how people were doing, how the women were doing within the department. By segregating us, it left people questioning, you know, well, how come they have to have this support group? How come they have to be at Station One or at Station Two? Why can't they be out at the other stations? We'd like to meet some of the women and work with some of the women too. You know, so it was, you know, and they were curious just as, just as much as we were. In those early years, I felt that about a third of the people I worked with were fine with me being there once they knew I had passed that final test at the fire academy to come into the stations, and a third who took a wait and see, and a third who just didn't think women should be firefighters, period. They didn't care if you physically were able. They just thought it was not appropriate. I even got some death threats from um, some of the uh, firefighters' wives, uh, well, if you sleep with my husband at the fire station, blah, 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 it's going to happen to you. And, you know, finally I got kind of tired of that stuff and I finally would say, listen, if, if you think I'm sleeping with your husband at the fire station, then there's more problems with, with your marriage than just me. Like my second year on the job, I gave an interview to a feminist newspaper, you know, and I talked about hoping that we'd get more feminist men on the fire department. I made some other comments about the job and how I felt like an overpaid janitor because I was a rookie, so I was cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, <laughs> you know. It was a free newspaper and some people had gone to the store at my station and they found it and there was a photograph of me and they put it up at my station and they made a little mustache and a beard on me and I, I don't know, there might have even been horns on I don't remember exactly, but needless to say, nobody was talking to me. And I I didn't quite understand why, and then I you know, saw this picture, and I believe Chief Durkin handled it kind of swiftly, got the pictures taken down, and or, you know, copies of it got made and sent to all the stations, you know, and all that kind of thing. And 
the union president gave me a call and he said you better come to the union meeting and explain you know what you said in the newspaper I had gone to one union meeting before that um, that's when they used to be down on Park Street the union hall there and there was a bar right next to where we had our meetings and and I'd been told you know the meetings kind of happen at the bar before they actually happen in the in the meeting hall you know and again this is a kind of a cultural thing but I walked into the bar and one of the firefighters um, stood up on the bar and pull, pulled his pants down in my face pretty much and I left and I did not go back to the union meeting when I was asked to go back to the union meeting because I'd had had that experience and um, it took many years and I eventually did start going to union meetings now and then later on in my career once I mean, I, there was, the guys on my crew were just like so embarrassed because they had encouraged me to come. You know, they were so embarrassed that that had happened. And, um, and you know, and they asked me over and over again to please come and, you know, that wouldn't happen again and that kind of thing. But, you know, I, it, it made a strong impression on me to say the least. So I wasn't going to go back there anytime soon. So, so yeah, so I didn't. Um, go to the union meeting, which you know the union president was advising me to do, and I have to say that you know that was hard. That was only my second year on the job, and the union, what it seemed like from the newspapers anyway, it, that the union was actually trying to keep us out of the fire department. It was that that was coming from the union, not from the fire administration. You know, so I didn't know whether to trust the advice. Of the union president. Um, over time I did have other interactions with him and I there were some things I liked about him and I had a grudging respect for him in, in some ways and he did come to my rescue in a, in a, in a meeting at one time and stood up for me. Um, so you know I think that that's kind of like you know over time the more time you spent in the stations and you all know that what a you know, kind of more, uh, kind of crosses that line, that uh, almost familial kind of relationships that you have in the station because you cook and you eat together, that type of thing. And, um, you know, eventually some people got to know me a little bit better. Some of the guys I worked with at Thel, if they used profanity constantly, it would be so offensive to me that I would just quit the fire department and leave and go away. And other comments like, you're an overeducated underachiever, you don't have any business being here, you know, just sit at the table in the morning when we usually have coffee before we start checking rigs and making sure we're ready for the day and doing our training or inspections, that, that time we'd all be sitting together. Chief Durkin wasn't necessarily my best friend. <laughs> and uh, he uh, sent me out to Station 5 to work with a crew that he felt was against the women being on the job. But after I got out to the station and started working with the crew, you know, their minds were changed, you know, especially after the first fire that we went to. And they, they saw that we were able to do that. But a lot of the other women didn't have that opportunity to prove themselves. So they were questioned for longer periods of time. I think the um, way that things gradually started to change with a few of the people who were really hostile about me being there and about some of the other women being there is that when you work with somebody day to day over time, you always find you have something in common and you start to develop a relationship of some kind. You know, eventually quite a few of those people, that hostility just seemed to kind of go away. I was building in a trade school. I was building cabinets and, and um, machine chop class and, and uh, welding class. The fire department was actively looking for women because they didn't want to be sued. Uh, the police department had gone through a lawsuit because they didn't have any women on, so they came in looking for people that were interested in non-traditional areas, and I sort of fit the bill. But what happened to me was really extraordinary because um, all of the skills that I had as a technician, as a, as a builder of musical instruments, I could apply to the fire service. So I caught on very quickly to the, the concepts that were uh, trying to be taught to, to us as recruits. 
As it happened, um, I was playing rugby, <laughs> and some of the first women that had been hired were on the team, and so they sort of recruited me. One person I went to college with, she was on the track team, I was on the basketball team, and I also knew a couple women firefighters, and they would you know, mention to me what you should put in for the fire department. A very good friend of mine at the time, Jody Carrilla, was going through the fire academy. I remember her saying to me, Gail, you would really love this job. You should try this job. And so I did. Well, what initially drew me to the fire service was um, the show Emergency. I always wanted to be a paramedic way back in the 70s, but when I graduated from high school in 1982, I didn't think I could be a paramedic or a firefighter even that way, so there was no female. So I went to school and became a park and recreation director and did that for nine years. And then I became a volunteer in my city where I lived in for five years, and then Madison was hiring. Laura Graff, who is one of our firefighters on MFD, she was new to the department. When I was a senior in college on the University of Wisconsin rowing team, we were working out and I was watching her carry these 50 pound dumbbells in each hand doing lunges across the floor as I was doing back extensions. And she says, hey Dinkle, you should join the fire department. <laughs> and I'm like, do I have to go to more schooling? And she says, you do, there's a fire academy. And I'm like, well, not quite ready yet. <laughs> About 20 years later, here I am. I was a whitewater rafting guide before, and um, I, I worked for a silo company. I mean, I've always been very physically active, and I've had horses my whole life. I always had an interest in EMS and, and helping people, and um, I had you know, taking CPR classes, and I became a CPR instructor, and one thing led to another, and I um, was dispatching for Sherwood Hills, and they encouraged me to take the EMT class, so I did. Um, and I started teaching part-time uh, in the EMS program, and a colleague actually suggested paramedicine. My supervisor at the parking services said, you seem like you like working with the public. And so I said, yeah, I, I do. I'm not really sure what I want to do at 32 years old still. I had spent some time in the Army, so I felt like I was gravitating towards something like that, but I just didn't know what yet. I said, well, the police isn't really my thing. The very next thing he said was, well, then you should try the fire department. I know someone. I could connect you with them. And I used to coach at a Division One college for about six and a half years. I like physical stuff, and I think that's why I loved coaching. After that, then I moved into another thing where I did recreational therapy with physically and sexually abused children for a while. Again, I was outside doing running groups and um, felt like it was a service um, position. And then Tracy, um, my wife on the job, was, saw something in me and asked me if she thought I would be great at it. I was um, like, oh, and tell me more about it. And so once she did, I realized, you know, the people piece, the physical piece is there for me. and then. Uh, the team aspect. Like I said, I'm, um, I was coaching for a long time, played for a long time, so I love the idea of a team. And so it just kind of fit into all things that I think make me tick. I was fortunate to have Tamara guiding me through a lot of the process for Madison, and every step of the way I'd meet with her and she'd have advice and just remind me that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I already had what it took. I just needed to make sure I presented it in the way I wanted it presented and she just was awesome. I mean, she was, there were mornings she came off work and she was tired or something major happened and she'd still take an hour, hour and a half to meet with me. And I mean, I, I can't even express how much that meant to me. Um, I was also very lucky that I had a former assistant chief that also guided me along the way. She was the one that encouraged me to get into firefighting. Well, I had begun a transition from military to civilian, and Ty Stebbins, who I came on with, um, who was applying for it, he said I'd be really good at it and looked into it, and, and that's how I got interested. There were already, there were, had been two classes of women for my class. Ours was the third class, and there was one other woman in my class. I think I was number 12. There were not any other women in my academy class. And I think there were probably about 20 of us, one of whom is Chief Davis. Um, so I shared my MATC Academy with a large number of people who are currently on the fire department now, actually. I felt pretty good about my experience of being the only woman there. There were definitely moments, don't get me wrong, where I clearly thought this person's screwing with me on purpose. But I don't feel like there were this, where there was this open 
negative feeling towards me as the woman. With my group, the men and the women were very supportive. I didn't feel a separation. I feel that was, I'm very fortunate that way. We would go through doing extremely physical things with a lot of weight, uh, the gear on. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, <laughs> okay, all right, it's not just sitting in a uniform, you know. So there was also sort of the uncertainty of what we would be going into after going through the academy, like just being fearful of firefight. It's terrifying, right? And then also the environment that we were learning it in. One of the things that stuck with me is that I remember it very well, especially now that he's the chief. But at one point he was like, I'd go into a fire with you. Chief Davis said, Steve Davis said this to me. And you know, I was a little older than him, but that's fine at the time. <laughs> but it meant a lot to me because I just felt like instead of being seen as a woman, I was more seen as part of the crew. When I was in the um, academy, I had been at the head of the class. Um, I didn't know that because I kept everything kind of secret. And the very final grading that they did was sort of a subjective, um, you know, zero to five. You know, is Megan on time? Zero to five. Is Megan have a clean uniform? Zero to five. And there were four evaluators, and um, one of them gave me all zeros, such that it would drop me to number two in the class. And he told the rest of the group, no way am I gonna have a woman be number one in the class. But I didn't learn about that until years later. But having gone through MATC Academy absolutely gave me a leg up when it came to starting with the Madison Fire Department. In fact, I would say that having observed some of the current and more recent academies that the firefighters and firefighter recruits have gone through, I see my Madison Fire Department Academy as more of an orientation. It was actually quite brief, and I believe that all of us, um, there were eight of us in my class, I think all of us came with either the MATC qualifications that I had gotten or the equivalent. I even remember one of the first days I worked, I was assigned to fire station number one. One of the women that had been hired previously called me at the fire station to see how I was doing. And I remember saying her name excitedly when I had the phone. There were other firefighters around and I remember her saying, shh, 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 shh. don't tell them you're on the phone with me. It was very eye-opening. I was so naive, I guess. I was shocked at the greeting. <laughs> I'll speak for myself, but I was not prepared for the hostility and the negativity and the anger <clears throat> and the idea that somehow I was taking somebody else's job and that I certainly couldn't do the job. I was just given the job because I needed to hire women. I was shocked. For the first couple of days where I was gonna be the only female on a crew of six, of course I was like, Okay, I'm, I'm the only female today, but quickly got over that. And I know that I can go to my crew of mostly men for anything, and I feel no different than they do. And even the days where I get shipped out to another station where it's all men and I don't know anybody, I've never met anybody, um, it's uncomfortable for a little bit until you get to know them, but you quickly become very comfortable and you ask people about their personal lives and you just be a happy person because we're given this opportunity as women to be here. And I'm sure that they wanna to get to know us as well. So I hope that we've all been welcoming ourselves and open. When you come on, you're the rookie and you're the one that was a rookie, you're now underneath them. And the woman that I was her rookie, as we call it, became a really good friend of mine and she was totally supportive and there for me the whole time. In the other respect, I had an older firefighter. He said, you're taking a job from a guy who needs to support his family. And I was like, yeah, well, what about me? I have to eat too. You know, so we'd have that conversation. It was a very short one. It was a kind of a learning experience for both of us. When I joined the fire department in 1989, at least on my crew, which of course I was the only woman, my first two weeks, Pam Jacobson was our lieutenant because Captain Schillinglaw was off on vacation. And so that actually was a really nice introduction for me. <laughs> I think that softened, you know, my first few months on the fire department in my perception. The way some of the guys 
were on my crew, I remember definitely guys going, can I say that in front of you? Some of them were struggling trying to figure out how to manage having a woman and do the right thing. I think their intent was good. Uh, that said, there were definitely some experiences my first few years where it was clear that I was not the first person to, to help with something. And uh, I mean, I remember, and I, again, this could have been my perception, but I remember somebody trying to open up a standpipe in front of me and I was the next closest person. And he like looked at me and then looked down the hall for the next guy and he was like, hey, come, you know, red man, come and help me with this. And I was like, okay, I'm right here. <laughs> so there were, there's little subtle things that happened. There were other things that were happening with other women that were more egregious, let's just say. And I would like to say and think that I had a pretty lucky road through it. I think I brought my personality and my like letting it roll off my shoulder maybe a little bit with me. Um, other women were not so fortunate. They had crews that were really hard. The very first day at seven um, was awful. And I think it's surprising to people when I tell them about it, especially with my personality now, because it wouldn't fly. But um, I had a great lieutenant, but he was sleeping at the table. We had a fill-in firefighter and a fill-in driver. And the driver um, just was so horrendous, um, asking me if I'd wash his windows in my short shorts with Becky and Sue, who I think were doing windows at the time, two women on the job asking me if I was interested, asking me if lesbians had Thursday night meetings and what we do at those meetings. And I'm brand new, like I am like, in, like a deer in the headlights. Um, he told me that he remembered me at a softball game. I'd come watch Tracy play fire against PD. And I just trying to stay in the conversation. And I had said, oh, I don't, I don't remember, you know, did, I didn't know if we had met. And I said, I don't remember you. How do you remember me? And he's like, well, the sausage always remembers. Like, this is disgusting. And so I thought, holy crap, is this what everyday life is gonna be like in the station for me? Like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Um, I didn't know how to, you know, how do I keep quiet? And it's just not in my upbringing. My father um, raised a very strong daughter. Um, and so I felt like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, every day and I take this. Um, I couldn't wait for the sun to come up. And so I went home and talked with Tracy about it. And she was, so angry and she told me that's not really like how it is every day and but I didn't say anything you know to anybody else I just kind of got through it and then I would say days got better when my regular crew was there it was much better <laughs> like I was so relieved um, I had a great crew with some older people that were getting ready for retirement so it was nice as an older person on the job at 36 that I um, could shine a little bit as the younger person <laughs> comparative to like some of the younger, like I didn't want to be up against some 21 year old guy, right? Like, so who does really? But um, so I got to shine a little bit and I had a great Lieutenant, Lieutenant Serqua, who took me aside and said, I know that you're like, he didn't say it in a negative way, but like, you're not a, you're not a, a, a young teenager. I'm not going to treat you bad and haze the heck out of you. And I'm going to respect who you are and your age and let's work together, things you need to know. And he was great. So um, I did tease him because he wasn't letting me drive to the store. And again, I said, you know, do you have a problem with women drivers? <laughs> and he laughed so hard. He was like, what? And I'm like, well, I never get to drive to the store. This was before there was all this AE checkoff and stuff. Like, you would just drive. And I'm like, I need to drive this thing. Like, when have I driven a fire truck besides out of the academy? I got to. So I'm like, can I drive to the store? So I advocated for myself, and he really appreciated that. And so things got better. I'm one of those where you say, no, you can't do that, and I'll prove you wrong sort of thing, um, because, <laughs> you know, I, I want to do it. Um, so I guess I, I, it wasn't really a factor initially, but you, be, you became more aware of it, and, and you learned about the history of the women that got on the fire department and the things that they went through. Um, I feel very blessed that the department was where it was at the point when I got on. I feel like the road was already paved for me in an essence. From day one, uh, my academy was super close. You knew that if you had a problem or if you were scared or if you were just having a really bad day that there was someone in your academy even that come up to you and be like, you good? And you talk about it and then, you know, Step up your lip and you move on with your day. Uh, but it's nice to know that there's someone there that you can talk to 
and become friends with. I have the most amount of friends that I've ever had in my entire life just by being on the fire department. And I was also very lucky. I had another female on my crew at Station 12 who kind of took me under her wing and taught me everything that I needed to know, even the little things that I may have been scared to ask. My lieutenant is very forward thinking and he he has never once made me feel like I was inadequate. It's always making sure everyone feels connected together, you know, on the same page. I guess maybe I'm just lucky. I definitely feel like I'm part of a family. Got a lot of support from the women that were already on the department, but it was also very um, clandestine support because if the firefighters they were working with knew that they were working with new women, I'm sure they would have heard about it. You know, some of the people that said, well, okay, you can do it now, but you're not going to be able to physically keep doing this as you get older the way we can. To me, it seemed just as important to um, keep doing that work, and that's truly what I loved. And, um, you know, until my retirement age, because I felt like if I, <clears throat> if I kept doing the weightlifting, the things that I, I did to stay in shape for, to do that kind of work, um, that I wouldn't have an issue. I started my career in Kenosha Fire. I worked really hard to get that one. I was one of two women on the job. Madison had several women and I went to college in Madison and this is where my degree is from and I love Madison so I applied. My experience in EMS made me fully understand the physicality of um, this type of work in the protective services. Um, but I, I really had some very incorrect assumptions about what firefighting was. I had oversimplified it. Um, I had my own bias in it. And so I can sum it up by saying I thought that it was just a bunch of big, dumb white guys who ran into burning buildings. I, I did not fully understand um, how much is involved in firefighting, how much you need to know. Um, and all the different tasks that you need to be able to do. Oh, I, I didn't know any other, I didn't know firefighters. I didn't know that when I first applied, I didn't know they stayed in the station 24 hours. So that was, uh, there was a big learning curve there. <laughs> just, that's all right, I learned. So I remember one of the first two days putting full gear on, face piece on, on air, in the blazing sun, and I wanted to pass out, feeling awful physically, even though I had trained for it. I just kept thinking that there are five other women in my class to help push us along. Our captain was a female and a couple of other lieutenants that you see what they can do, and you know that you were chosen for a reason your personality and your hard work and your dedication. We had two big guys in um, um, our academy, so they were both like 250 pounds, and I took them down a ladder by myself. Like for little old me, 5'7", right? Um, that was a really big accomplishment. And then it was also a realization that I had been encultured to believe that women couldn't do that, that I couldn't do that. And yet there I was on the fire ground doing it. I thought I was very well prepared to be on the Madison Fire Department being in my volunteer service. I was there for five years. I was the first woman on that department. I was just a part-time, I was a volunteer. I waited for the whistles to blow and then I got to go on a call and I wanted more. I wanted to do it full time. Madison you know, offered the job right away and I wasn't sure because I was scared. I was scared, it was new, it was big. I didn't know anybody in Madison. Any deficiencies I had, the Recruit Academy pounded it in you. The training staff was all male and then all the rest of our colleagues were male. And, and there were questions that I had that they couldn't answer. Um, a, a couple examples of that is what do you do with your hair? Right, so I can put my hair in a really tight ponytail, but as soon as I put my helmet on and start working, the helmet will, you know, slide around. So what's the solution? And none of the guys could give me that because none of them wore their hair long. It was women who said, well, even if it's 90 degrees, put your hood on because it'll at least hold your helmet in place. I had another experience with my first lieutenant, Ron Chuen. We were doing a ladder drill. So he, he was great in that he, he would make me repeat things that he thought that I was weak on. So every single day at lunchtime, I was required to go out and throw a ladder. One of those days, he noticed that I wasn't looking up to make sure that the dogs were locked. Instead, I was listening. And he, instead of just saying, you know, what the heck are you doing? He said, 
what's going on here? And I said, well, I can't, I can't look up. My, the back of my helmet hits my pack. It's because I have hips. So when I put my SCBA on, it just sits higher. So when I look up, it's, it's hitting that. And so he just took the time to work it out with me about what to do with the straps to lower it. And so I just, every time I throw a ladder, the first thing I do is drop my SCBA. And I didn't learn that in academy, right? I, I learned that through ex experience. It would have been great to have a woman saying, now listen, here's what you have to do. Originally, when I was first hired, there weren't cubbies or anything. It was a big wide open dorm and you were sometimes sleeping with, you know, eight guys. Um, and the reason makes sense. You couldn't have closed off cubbies because somebody might be missing a call and somebody needs to kick their bed and say, hey, we've got a call. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't anything. It was, it, it, and the pranks that happened then were also fun. So, you know, like the IV bags dripping over your bed. And like, oh, really? <laughs> so, is this is what we're going to do? Okay. So then you'd have to, of course, get back at them. But that was... <laughs> First, you had to figure out which one it was. <laughs> and so I had belonged to an organization called Women in the Fire Service, and there was a phone book, and I would look at what women were already listed in there on departments that I might want to work for, and I contacted them. And one of the things that stuck out to me about Madison were that there were so many women listed there. Like one department might have, of a comparable size to Madison, might have just two women listed. That didn't mean that they only had two women working there, but two women who then also belonged to women in the fire service and then also said they were okay with being listed in the registry. And so I just started going through that list and contacting the women on the list and saying, this is who I am and this is what I'm trying to do and I would just like to learn about your department. You know, as much as I think it's really important to have trailblazers, I don't want to have to force my way into some place who's not going to be welcoming and then have that to deal with in addition to just doing the work. I just want to do the work. So that's how I, I came to apply for Madison. I was involved with uh, women in the fire service uh, back in the 80s, and uh, they, are, uh, they were housed right here in Madison, and I fell in love with the community before I actually fell in love with the fire department. And because I was one of the very few women in the country holding chief level status, I was asked to come and to assist other fire departments in selecting their chiefs. So I was in, uh, I think it was Stillwater, I was there as an evaluator of the candidates for their fire chief position. And a young man that was sitting next to me happened to be friends with Chief Roberts of the Madison Fire Department, um, my predecessor. And so he jokingly said, well, what do you think you're going to do, you know, in the fire service? And I said, well, at some point, you know, I'll probably sit and write for chief. And uh, he said, well, there's a department in Madison that's pretty good. And I said, yeah, I, I've been to Madison. I, I know that community. And he said, well, their chief is going to be leaving. And that wasn't public at the time. So I thought about it and um, uh, knowing uh, the, how I felt being in the community, I thought that, um, that maybe I should try it out. After I applied, I was uh, selected as part of the, the group of people that were trying to get this position. It was a tremendous experience. I mean, what Madison did looking for the fire chief position uh, was extraordinary. They did the written examination. We did the, you know, the talk over the phone. I came here for an oral interview. But then um, when I went home, um, the police and fire commission got together all of the commissioners and they brought all of the commissioners to Tallahassee. They had selected, I think, the, the top three. And uh, they asked me to take me to people that I was managing. And so I'd go into a station that I had been managing and they would say, well, thank you very much, Chief Amesco, you can leave. And they would sit and talk with the people in the station. And that happened over a period of about two to three days where I would go to a restaurant. They would say, you know, take me to a restaurant that you might be interested in. Uh, and they would sit me down and say, introduce me to the staff, and I would introduce the staff, and then they'd excuse me, and then they would talk to the, to the staff at the restaurants. So, um, so Madison has always, to me, been a very um, innovative community and innovative department, and that, that was very attractive to me because I, I'm a non-traditional person. I'm, you know, I'm gonna be the first at everything I do because there simply weren't women doing what I was doing at the time. The Rapid Intervention Team is a team of highly trained firefighters that focus their skills on being able to, in a moment's notice, go into a situation where a firefighter 
has uh, become compromised. So you're going in to save the firefighter. You're there only to participate in the fire ground, but your primary interest is if something goes wrong, badly wrong, and we have firefighters down, your team goes in. So the RIT teams were already at Station 3 and Station 4. And then the department put together the all-female crew. Lieutenant Carilla and I had a lot of discussions <laughs> if we should do this. Uh, one of my concerns was like the bubble. I didn't want to be scrutinized daily. I also strongly felt that the crew should reflect the community they serve. It's not all women out there that we serve. But I just didn't want any publicity about it. I wanted to be left alone, do our jobs. I already worked with Jody and we had a couple guys here and it was all working out well. And it happened and holy cow was it a good time. I mean, we weren't not doing anything. We were doing everything together. And the comfort zone was incredible. I felt equal. I felt like for the first time, somebody respected that I knew things. Let me just do my job. Of we had the union and management and the firefighters um, actually come together in a committee to actually create the team itself. Then we started picking out, choosing people that were extremely fit and that worked extremely well together. And it just so happened that Station 3, it all clicked so that those women that were there were extremely talented and skilled at what they did. It was also interesting if one of us was off and a woman was shipped in here. That woman would like to do some training that she might have been scrutinized for and we just worked with her on that and then the guys would come in singly and, is that a word? And they felt comfortable training with us as well. And it was fun, we got a lot done, we learned a lot. It was an awesome experience to go out into retirement. We don't have a lot of women throughout the organization so to take a bunch of us and put in one station means other stations wouldn't have as many. And so the impact that we wanted to have as a, as a organization too, to think about that and, and put us all in one spot, was that gonna be good or bad? And um, I echo the same sentiment that when we jumped in, we were a little nervous, but it turned into an amazing environment. Teaching each other by giving each other confidence in the skill sets, being able to step in and own different roles just from the support that we provided each other. I'm sure that those things happen well with men on our organization too, um, but there was just something very special, not just about this group, but, but because we were women. That was um, intangible and unexpected. We've all been judged since the first day we started this job. <laughs> <laughs> so I might as well be judged with people that I love and have a great time working with. I feel as a rookie, you have your certain things you got to do every day. I don't think that changed. I felt more comfortable asking questions, coming to my lieutenant or my senior firefighters. I haven't done this in a while. Can we do this today? I haven't thrown a ladder in a month. Can I throw some ladders with you? I felt there was more of an open environment to talk about the things I need to work on and things that I had questions versus looking down because I haven't done something in a while. I feel like there was more of a comfort level, but we're in a profession where you need to judge yourself every day anyways. There's always room for improvements. There's always ways to be better at what you do, but they were phenomenal. I, if I could relive another year, it would be this year. It would be the year I was with them. I would go back to that any day. As a new firefighter on this crew or a younger firefighter in the organization, it was an outstanding opportunity. As other people got shipped into our all-woman's crew, we actually became experts because of our association to the RIT team. And so oftentimes you had somebody who was not an expert, who might have been a guy or somebody with more seniority than you. And being part of this crew, you, as that expert, you had a voice to share that information with them and gain confidence, learn how to communicate, talk about your experiences, your knowledge on the job, how we should perform on fires, things to be aware of. And in that little window every day, your confidence just sort of grew bit by bit, which I think really added to at least my overall confidence and ability to walk through the job on a day-to-day -day basis as I then became an engineer um, and additional responsibilities. I don't know, I did some recruiting. Well, let's talk about initially. 
You were a little apprehensive that I was being transferred over here. I was. Yeah. I had heard some not so good things about Big Mama. Yeah, uh-huh. And, the, and then when she got here. You could say it. It was just the rumor mill. Yeah. And I met Liza at a training, and I introduced myself to her, and the first thing out of her mouth was, my name's not. Francis. <laughs> and I thought, screw you, and left. Yeah, and then she got detailed in one shift, and we caught a fire, and she brought me a nice cup of coffee afterwards, and I thought, okay. Oh, the way to a woman's heart. That's right, but it was really her performance, and then you stepped in, and you wanted her. Is that that roof fire? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Carried a generator up a ladder yeah. three flights. <laughs> right, bloody hot day. That's our Liza. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Mindy very well, but I knew she was one strong cookie in more ways than one. Everybody's got to have something, Mama. Well, you were smart. Yeah, I got the, do you know that Mindy's coming to your crew? Like it was supposed to be some bad thing? And I go, yep, I do. <laughs> <laughs> she bit in. Like, can't wait to have her. We had all worked alone. Yep. We know what that isolation is like. You try to make the best of your 24 hours go to bed at night and think I'm working with so-and-so, it's going to be a long day. And then I go to bed at night with this crew and I'm thinking I can't wait for the alarm to get to work. It's crazy. 24 hours with these gals flew. It was I walked in here and I said, this is why these guys love yes. this job so much. They're working with all their buddies. It's so great. So a, a funny turn of the table, I think I heard after the crew wasn't together, as for women, you know, a spot would open up. Sometimes a, a guy would fill in and then go back to his buddies and, you know, why, why am I the guy that's got to go work with the all-woman crew, right? And it's a funny turn of the table. Oftentimes it's the woman who would be isolated working amongst the crew. So to now hear that echoed out of the guy's mouth to say, why do I have to be the one to, to have not seen the position that the singular woman was in amongst his crew of all men was just a real interesting moment for me to see it. And, and um, I'm not sure if, if people have brought that into their consciousness yet. Yeah. Welcome to our first 20 years right. on the job. Yeah. <laughs> or what if that guy didn't mind coming here and had to say it to keep his front going with the fellas and yeah. actually enjoyed a break from having to be all that and he could just be with us. And we had a lot of guys that were like that, mm -hmm. a lot. Um, yeah, I think a lot of guys try to play the game too, just to be cool. So. I did spend a, a couple of years um, in community education and I also was on the hazmat team when that was formed. And then like the last half of my career, I was a paramedic. So those were my specialties. So I actually started as a clerk typist in 1990. And then in 94, community education came open and I jumped on that because I absolutely love being out and um, you know with the public and talking to people. So clerk typist, nothing's wrong with that, but you're behind the desk. Me, I like to be out and about and I love kids. You know, I'm a social butterfly. We would go out and we go do presentations, we'd talk to the kids, but then slowly things got added. So car seat checks, so it's one to injury and prevention instead of just prevention and education. The fire department's the one that responds to these accidents and they see these children that aren't buckled up and have major injuries. And not only because of the fire department, but also the doctors are seeing the statistics on the kids. These kids aren't surviving. We need to make sure that they're in, in seats. So the first time I can remember this, we opened it up and said, we're going to have car seat check at station seven. And we did this with the hospital. The people waited for two, two and a half hours to get their car seats checked or to get some recommendations. And we also brought in a robot, a little dog robot to keep the kids occupied because these kids are waiting for two and a half hours. And after that, car seat checks are twice a month in the fire stations and we're hooked up with Safe Kids Coalition. And there's grants, which again is through the hospital where all the parents have to do is watch a video for one hour and they get a free booster seat. We're tied in because we respond to the calls and give that prevention message saying, you need a car seat and we team up with a lot of agencies, other hospitals, sheriff's department, police officers, it's, it's really cool. A big part of our job is going out into the community and it's not just doing fire inspections. You know, we go out into businesses, you know, we interact with, with business owners, with employees and businesses, and really we're looking at a, at a building and, and trying to make sure that it's safe for everybody, not, not just the customers or the employees, but also first responders. You know, we just wanna make sure that if 
you know, somebody gets into the building, they're able to get out safely. And it's a lot less about enforcement and more about education. Most people care and want to provide a safe environment for customers and for employees and firefighters, and they just need to know how to do it. They don't realize that actions they've taken maybe unknowingly have created dangerous situations. So we get to bring experiences that we have or things we know or things we've seen and help them remain safe for everyone. We're a small, very small division compared to the rest of the department, but I think people see value and, you know, obviously we're doing inspections full time. You know, we're, we're doing, um, you know, sprinkler and fire alarm testing on a full time basis. So really we're, we're just kind of supplementing, you know, the the roles and the inspections that, that, that the crews are doing and I think that we have a most of us have a good working relationship with the crews and we're able to, to talk about inspection issues when they come up and I think that they're uh, they're comfortable you know talking to us if they need help with something and I know everybody in our divisions more than more than willing to, to help out wherever we're needed if something comes up. So I coming out of construction and construction management uh, I would very used to being, you know, one of a few, only a few women. Um, I would say that coming to the fire department has been very refreshing because even though we still, as community, have more work to do to support women um, in a lot of different fields and and make it more equal, um, the department really focuses on it and um, and I really appreciate that. It's been a breath of fresh air. Uh, I feel far more valued here um, than I felt pr previously in, um, in other companies or other places. Um, and, and even though you can see issues, that there's active efforts to improve them. And to me, that's, that's the whole ball of wax is, you know, you don't have to be perfect, but you have to be trying. <laughs> the process to get on special teams has changed. I think you have to apply now and you have to go through a process to be, um, to be put on the special teams. Back when I first got hired, they would just say, who wants to be on the scuba team? And if you were at station one, you got to be on the scuba team. Who wants to be on the hazmat team? If you're at station five, you got to be on the hazmat team. Or station six, you got to be on the hazmat team. So that was the process. So pretty much if you were stationed at those stations, you, you pretty much got it. You know, I was on the hazardous materials team when I first was hired. I was on the um, scuba team when I was first hired. But I didn't stay at those stations for long enough to be, you know, a real hardcore member of the team, but being a paramedic was being a part of a big team. That I was on a call doing a patient assessment, and Cindy Walters, who was like almost everybody's favorite paramedic, everyone loves Cindy, the nicest person, fantastic paramedic, good firefighter. We were on a call, and I was doing a patient assessment as an EMT, and she whispered in my ear, you should be a paramedic. And it was like, oh my God, somebody wants me on their team. I loved being a paramedic, I loved the fact that you know, every day that I came to work was something different, you know, it's not predictable. And and it, it just felt like some of the really positive things we were able to do offset the, the really hard things that we saw. <clears throat> um, delivering babies, you know, versus responding to some horrible accident scene out on the interstate. I mean, it's harder to connect with a burning building than it is with somebody who's having a, you know, something that you can actually hold their hand or you know you see what they're going through and I like that part appealed to me. I like being able to be a firefighter and I really enjoy um, being a paramedic so to be able to come in and, and do both of those things has been um, a great experience for me. I became a paramedic and then I became a um, training officer then I became a training officer too under um, Captain Roman um, so I did some academies and then I became a paramedic too. It was like a really awesome moment in my career. You know, there was this thing where a lot of people told you don't be a paramedic if you're a woman because then it means you don't want to do fire. I, I didn't really, it's, it's a dumb thing that we keep going with that. I think that's like people see EMS is weak and fire is strong or whatever. I'm like, why can't you do both? Um, also as a middle-aged woman, I wanted to be really good at something. I, I was on the hazmat team the whole 24 years. Yes. <laughs> well, once I got it, it was great. <laughs> it, just, it was like, oh, we're going back to Chem 101. <laughs> but um, actually, Lieutenant Rice taught that, and 
I, I said, boy, I wish I'd known you when I, when I was in college because the way he described chemistry made a whole lot more sense to me. So, um, so that I, you know, after I dug in, then I really enjoyed it. Station seven is where I wanted to be. Um, I have a bachelor's in biology, which came with a lot of chemistry. Um, I'm a self-prescribed nerd, and I really find the science of the hazmat team um, to be intriguing. And I was very lucky to have a training captain that was also part of the hazmat team. And um, it, was, it was really awesome to have somebody encouraging you to be that smart person or that nerd or whoever you wanted to be to pursue that. Um, because it, it is a great opportunity. I was not the only woman on the scuba team. There was a woman on each shift. So I was the only woman on the A shift on the scuba team. And then I got off the scuba team when I became pregnant because you can't dive when you're pregnant. So I had to uh, tell my lieutenant. I didn't tell anybody on the job I was pregnant. So I had to, I was trying to get out of diving. I had a cold one week and then I had an ear infection the next week. And I didn't want to tell anybody I was pregnant because I didn't want anybody to know. And then all of a sudden I had to pretty much tell them I couldn't dive anymore because I was pregnant. And then I got out. Our department has never had a policy regarding what happens when a woman gets pregnant. And um, in you know, the rest of the city, with the exception of the police department, it's not really an issue because you just keep doing your job, right? And we've already got FLSA and maternity policies and all of that. Um, but in fire and police, there are risks to the pregnancy by continuing work and afterwards in breastfeeding. Um, so, you know, every time we touch our gear, we're absorbing toxins. The police brought up the lead in their ammo and having exposure to that. And then there's the obvious things like, you know, hot environments, toxic environments, just all of the things that are a problem for someone who's pregnant, much less the, you know, your gear doesn't fit anymore. It's the woman's choice to be able to tell when they want to tell the department they're pregnant. And yes, it is between you and your doctor and your family when you want to tell them and how long you want to be on. So it's nobody's business if somebody wants to go off at two weeks or somebody wants to go off at four months. I stayed on until 20 weeks and then I just pretty much couldn't fit in my gear anymore and then I felt the point that it was not appropriate for me to be on the line anymore. So when I first started in 1993, there was basically no light duty for Madison firefighters. If you wanted to carry a child, there were no resources. You would work as long as you could, and then you would exhaust all your sick leave but lose your place in seniority as well. So it really wasn't a good, there weren't many resources, not like today. So for years, it was just handled on a case-by-case -case basis, and women couldn't count on what was going to happen um, and oftentimes a woman who was pregnant was taken off the 48-hour schedule and put on a 40-hour schedule where she would accrue sick and vacation time at a slower rate and then when the baby was born she'd be put back on the 48-hour schedule and have to spend it at a faster rate. Right, so, so there was this inequity and it was difficult to get people on board because they thought, why should women have those special circumstances? Why, why should they be able to come to the 40 and still accrue at the 48 hour rate? Um, and, and that really persisted until we started to explain it um, in these terms. Well, if you want it to be equal, then every man who has a baby on the way in his family, they need to go to the 42. And then, you know, suddenly lights were turning on. We thought I couldn't get pregnant. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I was, and it's kind of, oh boy, how am I going to deal with this? And I, I spent the first, I think it was five and a half months on the job before I said anything. And then I told my officer that I was pregnant, but he was the only one that I told because if something were to happen to me when we were on a call, I wanted somebody to know that she's pregnant. You have to deal with that too. Shortly after that, I went and told Chief Durkin that I was pregnant and then he wanted me to go into the training division. So I went into the training division. I don't think there was a recruit class going. We did a lot of things like we set up elevator procedures, uh, how you would get into an elevator and you know, we take all the pictures. And I remember being nine months pregnant, crawling up on top of an elevator to take pictures of all the different mechanical things. We were doing a training on emergency driving. And at the time we had an old rig and it was an open cab rig. You had to be able to go forward and back up and you know, you'd make a star by the time you were done. 
And I was able to do that when I was nine months pregnant with a clutch vehicle. <laughs> I thought that was one of my biggest accomplishments because <laughs> my belly was pushing into the, into the steering wheel so much it was hard to turn the rig and everybody was out there just laughing. <laughs> I pumped for five months in the firehouse um, and we didn't have private bathrooms. We didn't have private anything. I was at station five pumping in a busy station in the, in the city, but um, it worked. We made it work. My crew came up to the uh, to the hospital, brought a bunch of gifts for me. When my son was born, we had difficulty with formula, so my husband would bring my son to the fire station for me to breastfeed. If we were gone on a call or something, he'd just sit and wait for us to come back, and there was some ripples about it going through the department, rumors being spread. So Chief Durkin wanted to change things to be done just a certain way, and it made things more difficult. And finally, my officer just said that Chief Durkin, just let us be, let us handle this as a crew. And we did, because I, you know, when my son came, it, it was always, for me, it was always a very private thing. You know, I'd go into a room where nobody else was, and, you know, I'd feed him for 20 minutes or whatever time it took, and, you know, my husband would take him away. Most of the time, the firefighters didn't, the other firefighters didn't even know that he was there. I decided uh, with my husband that we wanted to have kids and we had to do fertility, and so I sat down with the personnel chief at the time, Chase Stedman and explain to him what I was gonna do. I really wanna give it my best try. I wanted to let you know, because if I used sick leave, I didn't want you to think, you know, I was a lousy employee. He was very supportive, and then he talked to me about the policy that they were developing it, and he said, this would be perfect. You would be the first person to try this policy, and so each part of the process, I, I would talk to him and let him, so that he knew what was going on, and um, FMLA, I signed up for that, and it was nice because um, I, got to move vacation time and comp time around the procedures that I had done. I've been doing this for 31 years and I love what I do, but I love my kids and I wanted to try to breastfeed. I think I was really stressed out about how am I gonna make this work? Am I gonna be able to breastfeed? Um, new mothers, that, that's a huge stress. The accommodations were really nice, I have to say. Um, I took my breast pump with me everywhere. And when you go out, if there's not a clean room for you to breastfeed, you either have to do it in your car or you have to do it in a bathroom. And, and that's not very clean. So just the fact that I could come into work, they gave me a comfortable chair, they gave me a refrigerator so that my milk, I didn't have to try to sit through the firehouse and put it in a refrigerator in the kitchen. Um, the refrigerator had a lock on it so that I was assured if we went on a call, nobody was, you know, there was no chance of my milk getting contaminated in any way. I would come into work and I would have a conversation with my lieutenant. I would explain when the times of day I would breastfeed, how long it would take, um, and I would just let he or she know before I started and I would do a face-to-face -face when I was done so that they knew I was available for a call. What's nice about the current policy is that it leaves no question. So when you decide as a woman that you want to go on light duty, there are positions for you, anything from training to filing paperwork to doing inspections, those are non-hazardous. It's nice that there are positions for us now and so you don't have to worry about exhausting all of your sick leave and losing seniority just to have a family. Well, when I started with the city fire department in 1989, um, women were already pretty well integrated into the organization. And so I came in kind of on the tail end of people that worked here that maybe were apprehensive about having women in the field and the stations. We'd had women in the organization since um, as early as 1978 and officially, I guess, in 1980 and including the, the group that I came on with, uh, Recruit Group 4 in 1989. Uh, there was, I believe, four women in our class of, of 10, and they were, um, they were well established as people. So it, it made it um, pretty easy in our, uh, like our Recruit Academy, easy to get to know those individuals, and um, they really, um, were pretty well shaped and, and were able to guide um, 
the, the firefighters that they came on with, the six other uh, recruits, to know that women are here uh, in the organization and, and we're strong and we're not going to take any, any guff from anybody. And so, um, you know, I don't know what the organization was like, honestly, other than to hear the anecdotal stories uh, prior to women being here. It's just been a part of, I guess, uh, the fire department, the culture in the organization, and kind of my upbringing in the organization since 1989. I was young when I came on, and there was women on the job that were very formative in my career and my career development. Um, and, and a couple people that come to mind, one was Lieutenant Ann Hall. She was a strong mentor for me right from day one. When I came on the job, she was still a firefighter and she worked at Station One and, and she was just a person that you could gravitate to because she was a, a strong thinker, physically very strong. Anytime I had discussions with her early on in my career, I always took something away that made myself better and my own thought process better. After I had about five or six years on the job, I got assigned to a crew that had a woman lieutenant. And I heard a lot of chatter before I went there, um, the challenges that as a white male that I was gonna face under this particular leader in our organization. And quite honestly, I got there and probably went in with some biases that were formulated based on others' opinions and they couldn't have been further from the truth. She was actually one of the better lieutenants I ever had worked for on the department and that was Lieutenant Pam Jacobson. Promotions had been done historically more like you wait till people are in their last three years and then you promote them. Kind of everybody kind of takes their turn and gets promoted, you know, so you can, um, you know, for financial reasons. A couple of the women in my class went for promotion, got promoted at like seven years on the job. And that was like, oh my gosh, they're too, they don't have enough time on to be promoted, you know, that kind of thing. And um, so, you know, that was out there in the culture that um, it wasn't really appropriate to apply for promotion too soon. There were people who said that, you know, the first women and, and some of the first minority males should compete for promotion to, you know, to help others coming behind them to get into those positions. It was way too intimidating to think about being in charge with people that had so much hostility. There's so much judgment <clears throat> in just being a firefighter or being a paramedic to then be an officer and truly have other people's lives in your hands and to be under such scrutiny as a woman, I didn't have the guts to do it. And I saw what other women were going through. Also, I was very happy on the ambulance then. Um, and I'd made a decision that if I was happy in a station working with people that I liked and loved, that was good enough for me. After seven and a half years, I applied to be a lieutenant and then was hired as, or was promoted to be a lieutenant. Well, at the time I competed to become a paramedic, that was a competitive process, Then I think it's less true now. I really loved the work so much that I never chose to pursue promotion to lieutenant or at the time we had captains. I was at Station 1 for about six months, and then I went out to Station 5. I think it was five years, because then after that I went to Station 6 and got onto the hazmat team and then shortly after that I applied to be a lieutenant. It was a fairly long list so it was kind of the second half of the list that I was promoted at that time and then I was an officer for 19 years. Mary Sweeney was a great example and I said um, when I met her I, I knew one thing and that that she was one badass woman and you did not mess with her. She taught me lessons throughout my career as well of just right and wrong. And it might have been something as simple as not loading the hose back on the engine correctly, but she was right there to correct any behavior that she saw, whether it was at the kitchen table or on the fire ground on a call. And so um, they were very well respected, I think, in the organization because they had been through those battles for the last uh, 10 years when I came on knowing that they had another good probably 15 to 20 year battle left. I think that over time there was still a very subtle level of um, sexism that pervaded, especially for women who became officers. And I remember 
seeing that and knowing like, for example, there would be a fire and the, there would be a woman officer that ran that fire. They were the first in and they were in command until the chief's car got there. And there would be so much, there, there would be, there was always armchair quarterbacking after every big fire call that was on your shift because we just didn't get many fires. You know, we got fires, but not that many. And so we always, you know, looked back and critiqued. But to me, there seemed to be a much higher level of criticism when there were women officers that, and, and I remember probably in a subtle way that probably influenced me not to work harder to try to be a lieutenant. I decided to write for a lieutenant um, because that just seemed like a natural progression that I wanted um, that experience and it was the right time. I can't say that there was any one thing that inspired me, but that was kind of my, I thought my natural progression. You know, I'd been a paramedic too. I felt like, you know, it's time for me to step up and do the lieutenant thing. I feel like I know what it, what it should be. Like I have a really good sense having been on the department of what works and what doesn't. And, and maybe it's my turn. I think part of what influenced my choice in that, um, whether it was the timing or to do it at all, had to do with like realizing that I was gonna be scrutinized and criticized at a level that was definitely, in my perception, higher than the average person. Again, my perception, uh, I think there's some people who share it, however. <laughs> um, so as far as where it has been when I left the fire department, I, I think that there's still a little bit there. I started as a lieutenant at Station 4, and I was the least senior person. When you don't have seniority in the fire department, that is extra pressure, at least I felt that. Some of them had 20 plus years, and I was supposed to tell them what to do. I had to respect their experience. They certainly didn't try to undermine my authority. I didn't feel that. They would suggest, let's do that. I'm like, well, that's a good idea, you know? So when you have less seniority, I, ha I had to respect the people with the experience. One of the things I learned from, from Ann Hall early on is that if women are gonna be in the fire service, they can't fight the fight alone, and that they need men, and primarily white males, since white males dominate uh, organizations across the country, to actually stand up for them. And I distinctly remember having that very conversation with her one day about um, there was something in the organization that was going on, and I said to her, geez, how can you, you know, let this happen? It was something um, that, that, that kind of divided the department that was half against women and half for women. And she said, you know, Steve, until you as a white male stand up for me, this stuff is going to continue to occur. And, of course, that's then a, a light bulb moment, right? And that was probably 20 years ago now. Um, but th that that discussion sticks with me to this day. I can still see us uh, standing on the apparatus floor at Station One. I felt like I had equal access to promotions. I feel like I was never um, denied anything. I think if I wanted to go further, I could have, or I would have, and I would have tried. I was happy where I was at. I didn't feel like I was denied anything as a female on the job. So I came here knowing that I was going to get myself promoted. I had been just newly promoted to the rank of lieutenant in my previous department, so it was just a matter of learning what I needed to learn here and then putting myself in those positions to gain that knowledge. And I wanted to ensure that I knew the job of a ladder company firefighter. And so I went to station two on ladder two for a while. The first promotion that I was able to achieve was to apparatus engineer. You could test for that at five years. I had to wait seven years because of my hiring date the way it lined up with the process happens every two years. So I uh, moved into that position. And then as soon as I was able to test for lieutenant, I took that, I challenged that promotional process and was successful. Tracy Burris is another great example of coming into an organization and having a prejudged bias against you. What I knew about Tracy Burris is that she was a lieutenant on a, a different job, didn't really know where, didn't really care to know where, and she was a black woman that came into the organization. And on the first day of the academy, Chief Amesqua called her lieutenant. That one comment ran rampant through the organization of, Chief Amesqua has hired our first lieutenant 
and that she's not going to have to go through the process, which was completely not true. And so I think the whole organization formed this bias against Chief Burris that really wasn't fair. Because at the end of the day, she is a good firefighter and a good servant to this city. And when I became the division chief of training, she was working as a, an instructor in the academy. And um, I was the new fire training chief, so I had to go out and get to know the staff that I had inherited. And Tracy and I sat down, um, probably within the first 10 minutes, we were automatically synced. We thought alike, we had the same vision, the same philosophy. She's a heck of a communicator, so you know what she's thinking and you know what she's telling you um, is gonna be well thought out. And so we synced up like in the first 10 minutes. And um, I thought at the time, this was prior to Chief Amesqua announcing a retirement, but I thought at the time, if I'm ever given the opportunity to become fire chief in the city, Tracy is gonna have to be on my team because she gets it. Chief Holtz, um, being one of the first women that came into this organization, she probably took on the brunt of the ira and the fury of the Madison firefighter males. So she did go through some rocky times. But I think as she came back and realized what we were actually doing, you know, we were completely changing an organization that's been around since 7 BC. I mean, literally, people have been fighting fires ever since dirt. And so um, to come in as a woman to do this, you had to, you had to have tenacity. And Chief Holtz was a master at it. I mean, she hung in there. I believe she went through a lawsuit and came back and she became a very, very successful uh, chief level officer and people loved her in the organization. She was a great leader. She taught me so much about being a leader and being prepared and being fair to people. And she probably, as kind of a trailblazer in the organization, could have gone the other way and just been sour grapes and not put herself out there and protected her own personal interests, but never did that. Um, she was always willing to share stories about what she had learned and experienced. Uh, and she was always right there to call BS. And, and quite honestly, um, when I was a lieutenant under her, she needed to do it. And I always appreciated that. Chief Amasqua had sort of a, a difficult <laughs> understatement time because she had come from the outside and she was a woman. And so there was a lot of resistance to what she wanted to do in her initiatives. But I always felt that Chief Amasqua was really good at supporting the people that she believed in, whether they were men or women. Um, and she certainly was a role model to women. She is our fire chief and isn't that great. She had battles with her own administration team. She had battles with the mayor's office and some of the city administration. And she had battles with the union. So I didn't know this at the time when she came to Madison in 1996. But um, as I've read through some of the documents that she left for me, it amazes me what a strong person she was. You know, she improved our hiring processes and our recruitment. Um, she improved our promotional processes. She, she tried to create equity in the organization and sometimes was fought very hard on that equity so that people would have a fair chance, regardless of gender or race. So I feel somewhat obligated to, to carry on uh, the work that she's done because she was strong enough to do it. You knew that you were going into a completely foreign environment. And, and it was a place where um, I think that the uh, male firefighters felt like this was their space. And, and when I took that on, I knew that there would be controversy. And I oftentimes joke, I have never been disappointed because there were a lot of controversial issues that came up during the 16 years I was here. But what, what was important to me was that um, being the kind of person that I am, you know, I'm, I'm a daughter of, a, of an immigrant. I'm, I'm, my family were, were migrant workers. Um, we were in the fields. Um, for me to get a job in the fire service at any level was extremely important to my family. So, um, so they took on someone who understood that it was a privilege for me to be in that position from the get-go you know, even as an as entry-level firefighter. 
and going up straight up through the ranks, I knew that every position I was taking, it was the first in our department, whatever department I was in, because we simply were not around before that. So I knew that I was gonna be the center of the bullseye. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I trained for that. When they were hired in 1980 and when I came on in 89, they were starting to be at the peak of their career. And in the organization, between 10 and 20 years, you have a voice and you can really champion change because you've got the time on that we covet so much. Um, not all of them were in formal leadership roles, but they worked as paramedics and firefighters and some lieutenants. You could tell that they knew that they weren't gonna give up on the fight of their place in the organization. These people aren't gonna go away and they know more about this job than, than you do or potentially ever will. And so you, you best listen to them because they're experienced, right? And I think when Chief Durkin hired them, he hired them knowing that they're gonna need to be resilient for the next 25 to 30 years. And they're gonna have to carry this water, this battle that women belong in the fire service um, throughout their careers. Yes, Chief. Durkin held a party for our fire academy class after we graduated at his home and people brought their families and my parents were there at the party. Ed came up to congratulate me and talk with my parents and he said to my parents that, you know, when I first saw her, I figured there was no way she could do this because um, she looked like a librarian to me. And my dad said, oh, just what does a librarian look like? And he started to say, well, you know, she was in a glasses and looked a little like a spinster <laughs> and then he kind of paused and my dad said well it wouldn't be too surprising that she looked like a librarian because both her parents are and you can imagine he was quite embarrassed I mean eventually over the years he had quite a sense of humor about it but it was an unforgettable moment. <laughs> One of the things that Chief Durkin did was when he became fire chief and there was this push to hire women at that time in the city of Madison. He met other women firefighters around the country, talked to them, found out, you know, what were their challenges? How was it going? Could they do it? Do you have to be a six foot two, you know, 200 pound woman to be able to do this job, that type of thing? And so he really educated himself on on those aspects. He had admitted very quickly that, you know, his, his idea of, you know, the women that, that he saw as athletes at UW-Madison, things like that, that shot putters, you know, like they'll be, they'll be good, strong firefighters. He had this idea in his mind what a woman firefighter would look like, and he was the first to say, I was wrong. I think he was a visionary in a lot of ways and he really believed in the women that he hired and that there were many other women out there that just needed to see us and be encouraged and that they'd be a real asset to the fire department. I think he was really a special guy with a, with a big vision and we all benefited from it. We um, miss him a lot. After I became chief, he and I had talked several times throughout the year, call and check in, see how things were going. You know, he wouldn't give me advice on fighting fires today or even hiring people or anything like that, but he was a resource for me to bounce some leadership things off of. So I got to know him before he died. And but I went to his visitation or his memorial and I was taken back by the people out of class 1980 and beyond that he hired the women that talked about how he was so invested in them as a person, um, to summarize and that he always encouraged them to be who they were, regardless of uh, the people that, that try to tear them down and things like that. And I, as I was sitting there, I thought, you know, he was pretty clairvoyant. I have not done enough in my mind to provide spaces in our firehouses or in our organization for people to be who they are regardless of gender, regardless of race. I think we, we do a great job of providing safe spaces, safe physical spaces, but we don't always do a great job of providing safe emotional spaces. And what they talked about at that, at that service was the amount of emotional space that Chief Durkin gave them to be successful. And so it was another light bulb moment for me of I need to do more as the leader of this organization 
to provide that emotional space for people to be safe, regardless of gender, regardless of race. Um, I think that in the workplace, we all need to feel physically safe, but also emotionally safe. And sometimes the two are tied together. Sometimes they don't ever intersect, right? And so that emotional safety is, over the last three years or so now, is really an area that I've tried to focus on um, by listening to people, by trying to make some changes, um, small changes, some big changes. The ultimate goal for me is to try and get this organization to a place where everybody feels emotionally safe. We're human and there's emotions. There's um, things where they have to work themselves, you know, they have to work it out. You know, it's not just, yay, we just put a fire, hurrah, well, now that's it. Nope, we're, you know, people are human. And these things that the firefighters um, respond to, they need to get, you know, just talk about it and get some help. Uh, one of the things that, that we recently implemented a, a few years ago uh, is uh, the Madison Fire Department's peer support team. We work in conjunction with the employee assistance program and have support of both the administration and our local uh, to be able to, to reach out and help support members, connect them with resources from issues that may come up uh, because of mainly the accumulated stress of the job. Um, it takes uh, a lot out of each person every time they go on an emergency response. Different things affect people differently. So just to be able to uh, make sure that our members know that regardless of what they're going through and what situations may arise, there's people there to support them and connect them with any resources that they may potentially need, whether that's um, more so based at home or stuff that's going on at work. It really um, is all-encompassing. It's just to, to support each other in, in any way that we really need to. You know, I think there's been times in the last 30 years where I've seen uh, women's place in the organization take a step back somewhat, um, and there's probably specific moments, but, but also um, it's a hard question to answer because they've just been part of the fabric. And I can think back to um, stories over the years where maybe there was a um, anti-woman male uh, in a station that had an opinion about certain individuals or things like that, that um, if, if you had an open mind and you really watched um, those individuals perform, it was really hard to judge because their performance was good, right? They, they, they did things just as well as any man on the job. We had to get out of that rut in the fire service as a culture, as a male dominated culture. And I still think that we're still working through that. And we may work through that for a number of years yet. But organizations like the city of Madison, when we had strong leadership, leadership from a woman that's very strong, um, those things are gonna be short lived because now we're, we're moving on to a much more different and much more compassionate organization. There would be different dynamics based on personalities, but not, not gender. You have, um, at all the stations I was a paramedic at, we had a lot of windshield time. So you'd get into political discussions, firehouse discussions, I mean, just there was a lot of time to get to know each other. Um, and that would, be, that would be how your dynamic functioned, not a matter of, I mean, you could present things from my side as a woman and they present their side from a man and you know and then you hash it out and then it was good everybody regardless of male or female i think they we all bring a different part of um, ourselves to the job i've seen a, a lot of women connect uh, easier especially with uh, women who were going to because there was uh, some sort of domestic abuse situation or or different pregnancy problems that they may not feel comfortable with um, opening up to, to a male counterpart. Um, our men on the job are very professional, but there's just something to be said for that, that female connection. And that's one, one of the many ways uh, that um, diversity uh, among men and women in, in the department is, is important. One of the strengths in our organization is, is diversity, but not just gender and race diversity, it's thought diversity. That's a key to the success that we've had as an organization. People really make up their own minds and their own opinions on places and individuals and things like that. Coming in and being integrated into the organization right from day one, women are here and they were here to stay. If you couldn't deal with that, um, you know, I think the suggestion was then this place is not for you. 
We had some old timers that we had that we struggled with. But I don't think it's changed that much, but I do think that they are more accepting of all cultures, all diversities. I think the culture today is accepting of everybody, and that's just the science of the time. Fire service loves tradition. There are certain aspects that I think that everybody still wants, and you can't go back in time, but we can change and adapt that into something that's gonna be better. One of the big issues that, that every organization, not just Madison Fire, has to continue to work on and overcome is history, right? And, and things that people learn along the way. Um, and when I came into the organization in 1989, the culture was really, uh, you gotta have thick skin, you gotta toughen up, you gotta just suck it up and go with it, kid, because it's not gonna be any easier. There's a level of culture where that is, a, is not a bad thing, right? We get, we get called to situations where none of us want to be there, but in that moment, we got to just suck it up and do the job. Uh, whether it's a fire call or an EMS call or, or special rescue or things like that. But it's those moments where we don't need that, but we carry that culture in that actually um, tears at the kind of the fiber of the organization. That yeah, we can have that tough Teflon coating in that moment when nobody would want to be there, but, but we're the fire department and we don't have anybody else to call. But let's leave it in that, in that field or in that building. And then when we go back, we, we drop that side of the culture. And, and that's a hard switch for people to make sometimes, especially if they've been around here a while and they've, they've formed those biases, they've formed that Teflon coating, if you will, uh, around their emotions, around their physical being, and, and it's hard to make that switch. And that's where we see, you know, that, that acceptance become an issue because I've got this tough Teflon coating. I'm not gonna accept anything you do or say. Ignite Women of the Madison Fire Department came together formally when we put together a nonprofit. Really Ignite started long ago. A community developed of all the women who have worked for our organization and quite naturally they were meeting, hanging out, having potlucks, talking, problem solving, looking for opportunities for support of each other. And over that course of those 40 years, we've continued to do all those different types of community action oriented items. And it's really grown bigger. You know, I think uh, oftentimes we want to get together and, and find support of each other and share stories, get to meet people who've come before us and celebrate and appreciate somebody that came through the organization 20, 30 years ago and what it is for those people who are coming into the future of the organization. There are the other things that we've done for the community. We have found ways to staff soup kitchens. We've done fundraisers where we have addressed women-specific issues. We've done some clothing drives and things that maybe are not as recognized in the community. Different agencies actually have looked to us specifically because we are a women's group, because maybe we're recognizing some of those needs. That might also be fostering the future of tomorrow. There are some younger women and teenagers that are interested in getting some experiences and hearing stories and experience what it is to be a firefighter. And we can go out and um, engage with the community and provide some of that, uh, those extra touches. One of the programs that uh, we highly regard and, and have um, thrown our support towards is uh, Camp Hero. For a long time in my career, every time women got together, we would talk about, we need more women in the fire service. And there was a lot of talk. And there were, there were efforts in recruitment, but they were way too late. We were approaching young adults. The efforts were great and the harvest was minimal. I had found myself in sort of a unique position. Um, I had lots and lots of connections through Madison College. I'm also a proud member of a very special organization called the Girl Scouts, which not only gave me connections, but had taught me how to bring people together and to put them in the right spot and train their eyes on a vision and move them towards it. So that's what I did. I say that the planets align, not just me, it's people that are willing and in the right places and leadership that's going to support. And all those things had to come together. We formed a group of men and women from police, fire, and EMS and Girl Scouts and said, the problem is so big, it's so overwhelming. Like you, you, you get paralyzed, you don't even wanna take a step towards a solution. So let's back off 
and what can we do in our little world? And that group of people continued to meet and eventually Camp Hero was born. So now Camp Hero is offering experiences for all age girls, kindergarten or just graduated from high school, and women to experience the protective services in a way that is safe, developmentally appropriate, and is planting that seed so that they think of it as a possibility for themselves. And it's, it's not a recruitment tool. It's not come work for the Madison Fire Department or Police Department, though that would be great. Um, instead, it is, it's a way to help girls find their confidence. It takes a certain amount of courage to step into a group of people that are not like you. And then we also focus a lot on character building, like what kind of person do you need to be if you want to move into this sort of realm. We envision this as a thing for kids. But what it did was it brought a whole bunch of adults who all have the same sort of passion and vision together. And now we're all connected and making changes within our departments. It, 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 it's super cool stuff. I'm so proud of it. And I'm so proud of all of the people that have been involved um, over the years. Trailblazers, man, they get the arrows in their butts. Mary Sweeney and Marshall Holtz were absolutely like, I give it up to them because they took they took it, man. They got fired and then rehired and they they took all the shit, man. Not not all of it, but like the brunt of it. And then the next group took the next dose of it. I feel those women that came on in the 80s had all, have really deserved the, all the credit in the world for what they went through because I felt at this point um, when I started it, like I said, it was it was like a paved road compared to what they went through. Oh, they're like mythical creatures to me that came in here. There wasn't even a trail at all. They were in there with their, with their machetes, you know, <laughs> chopping away um, just to be able to get through. Um, and each generation that has come since has widened that trail and groomed it and made it better. So I felt like all the women in our class were trailblazers in different ways. Jan Jefferson, Pam Jacobs, I'm not gonna get them all, Rory Ward. Megan Williamson's, Marsha Holtz. Denise Sullivan. Bev Burr. Uh, the Ann Halls. Cindy Walters. Tammy Nelson. Liza Tatar. Mindy Hewitt. Tracy Reek. All of them. Uh, it, it's a continual uh, cultural change that, you know, women are continuing to be more accepted and more integrated and, and I think people are becoming more receptive to the fact that uh, having a diverse group of people that all has different strengths and, and connect, can connect with different people in, in different ways, that that's a really important thing. But um, I think it's something that's going to just continue to improve and I think that everybody who's been a part of it uh, from the beginning up till now has, has a place in that. I feel myself more as a mentor for the any firefighter, men and women, especially the women. I wanted to be a good example and a good leader for them. I didn't know that I would be coming into a big political arena or, or to become any kind of a trailblazer. I just, I just wanted to do the job and that's, that's all I really wanted. Being a role model um, is, is being the first of anything and being a, a, a good role model. It wasn't just a role model. You really had to um, understand that uh, you, you were privileged to be in the position that you're in. And uh, in my mind, uh, and in my mother's mind, <laughs> I had better do it and do it well. Um, and I know that I had never disappointed her. I, I, know, I knew my craft, I knew the organization, and I knew that we were gonna struggle. Um, but I also felt that, that um, I had struggled coming into the fire service. I mean, Title IX was brand new when, when I was coming up as a young person, uh, which meant that there were, there were a lot of women in my position that were getting into uh, occupations that women simply just did not uh, participate in before that. So I took that privilege seriously, and I, I really did try to, to make sure that I was good at what I did and not go beyond what I thought I could do. I didn't know any girls until I met Mary Leslie who wanted to be a firefighter when they were little. And she did and I thought that was the coolest thing. Um, I, and I think we can change a culture to where maybe girls can think about that when they're young and not um, be pigeonholed into it, you're just gonna do this and that. I would like to think that, you know, uh, my career was a little bit inspiring to the next person. I mean, whether it was a man or a woman, 
or you know anybody else um, I think I look back with a huge amount of gratitude and um, like I feel like I just like had a lucky career there are a lot of things I was told in my life I can't do and to me that was just like really watch me <laughs> so even my parents were, were like you can't do that you're a girl I'm like why not me the biggest trailblazer is my wife who I feel like um, is an african-american female who works her ass off for this department and couldn't love it more um, to me is probably my most like I'm most inspired by her daily although there is always going to be work to do I think that organizations in general not just the fire service have come a long way in trying to make the workplace and careers and jobs more attainable by all and then when you get in it to have um, systems processes policies that are available to all um, and so I think there's still work to be done there but I think that tra trailblazing in the 21st century to me is something I guess I would say to show up and, and know you belong there is, is for the individual to know they belong there and not wait for someone else to say you belong and to advocate and fight for yourself because that is, um, I think, a thing that is, I don't know if it's instilled or just a, a natural thing, I think more so for men to advocate for themselves and to ask for things and demand things even and to question things when they don't seem right and to continue at it. And I think I, trailblazing for women looks more like that, like to show up and know that you belong there, right?